The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you video two out of a three video series covering my orchestration of Vasil Barvinsky's Prelude in G Major for the 2022 Orchestration Challenge. My first video outlined the first two sections of the Prelude in atomic detail, which I feel is only fair since most entries to the challenge will be from website subscribers orchestrating the opening 18 bars. I also went over my choice of instrumentation and my approach to lecturing for this series, so if you haven't watched it yet, pause now and click through to that first video via the link in the info below. This video and the next one are going to be quite a bit shorter, especially without all the introductions. In this part two, I'll discuss my orchestration up to the middle of the big tutti section, but to start off, let's jump right back to where we left off in the piano score at rehearsal letter C. Here we run straight into one of the concerns I mentioned in my Pitfalls video, that the thematic content merely restates itself without any significant functional development. I see this both as a potential problem and an opportunity. If the orchestrator simply repeats what they've done before with the same instruments and essentially the same relationships, then I feel that the whole arrangement will really seem repetitive. On the other hand, the orchestrator can take the opportunity to follow the emotional progression of the music in their choices of timbre and texture. The opening statement was elegantly simple, the restatement lush and generous, becoming a background to a wandering line that emerged upwards from the left-hand patterns. Now the third appearance of the statement is like a calm surface over the restlessness of the left-hand octaves. Keep in mind that this follows some extreme fluctuations of the tempo, and, of course, those wandering melodies. So the a tempo also represents a kind of stabilization of the piece, getting back on track, and preparing the listener for more intense, driven passages to follow. The crescendo invites the orchestrator to warm the texture, with an eye to the upcoming transition ahead. Notice that I supply both a single pickup note to the next page that's in the original score, and Violina Petrichenko's dotted rhythm that falls into line with the previous bar. For all I know, her choice there may have been by impulse or intentional, or based on a version of the prelude that isn't reflected in the original printed edition. So instead of opening that can of worms, I simply gave my participants the option of doing either version. This section may seem simple compared to what came before, but I feel that it's all more of a balancing act. For instance, those left-hand octaves, if overemphasized, might ruin the restless quality of the passage, turning it into more of a grind. So my instinct is to keep it subtle here, pacing the flow of the thematic material above. There's a beautiful opportunity here for the orchestrator to infuse a lot of color and intensity to the crescendo in their treatment of the middle voice from the end of bar 32. Let's bring Violina Petrichenko back and have a listen to her interpretation of this section. To a great extent, I'm taking my cues about the emotional progression of the piece from her playing, and she really delivers. And 
right now for my attempt to live up to what's expressed in that gorgeous piano playing. When I got to this section as an orchestrator, I was all too aware of the need to change the quality of the texture compared to the previous passages. It was time to bring in new ways of playing things, and new voices. As you may have noticed in the previous lecture, I'd avoid using brass up to this point except for a touch of pianissimo horns to underline the texture here and there. Looking forward, I felt it was time to bring them in, sparingly at first, starting with a simple horn solo. I leave off the octave melody and just let the horn fill in the picture with its rich, generous sound. Here's an example of some topics about dynamics I've talked about frequently. A solo starting on a piano dynamic, not needing to be marked up to mezzo piano or mezzo forte. The range of the bottom half of the piano's octave melody covers the sweet spot of the horn beautifully, culminating in that glowing written D at the end. The next question was how to harmonize that melody in thirds from below, and have those thirds go on to become distinct middle voices. Adding more horns actually makes things too dense here for my tastes. It becomes all about the horns as a section, putting the focus on a blocky kind of chorale texture, when what I really wanted was for the first horn to shine as a soloist, with some support. My solution was to use second clarinet and bass clarinet here to play those thirds. I love the combination of Chalamot clarinet with throat tone and upper Chalamot bass clarinet. To give that middle voice a more shimmery quality, I double those clarinets with tremolo violas. At the crescendo, I make it even more shimmery by having the second clarinet play fingered tremolo, and giving the bass clarinet a rest in those bars so as not to overdo it. But I do bring in more horns at the end, pushing into that last bar in combination with first trumpet and first and second trombones, a voicing of a ninth chord for a bit more impressionistic intensity. There was a kind of intimate character to the previous passage, with shared wind solos and unaccompanied string groups playing very thoughtful lines. I wanted to contrast that closeness with a more distant, gleaming, slightly angelic quality here. So I supplied an upper G octave pedal throughout in tremolo second violins, which I feel adds a bit of emotional distance and also underlines the restlessness and anticipation of greater things to come. Then on top of that, I add the melody as a delayed commentary in octave first violins. Notice the doubling on the lower voice of that octave in alto flute plus oboe. I'm giving the second oboist, who's only played a few notes up to now, a chance to warm up their embouchure a bit more, and also form an intriguing blend with the hollower alto flute while thickening the lower divisi first violins. A touch of glockenspiel adds to the gleaming, angelic character. I could have had the glock start earlier, but less is really more in these situations. In both the horn solo plus clarinets, and the echoing first violins plus oboe and alto flute, I let the middle voice supersede the octave melody as originally scored by Barvinsky. That allows me to really intensify the energy here, more than if those simple leaps up from A to D were dominant. That just leaves the interpretation of the left-hand octaves. I wanted to accentuate the bustling undercurrent here, so I scored divisi tremolo and pizzicato lower strings, playing through the same pitches as the piano score, trading off through the most resonant registers from basses to cellos and back. The intention is to give the pulse as much timbral flavor as possible, keeping the energy simmering along below without blotting out any of the action above. Does any of this make sense? Let's find out by playing through this page with the mock-up. I feel that Note Performer can give you a pretty good idea of what's going on here, though it's no comparison to the subtlety and sensitivity of live players, nor the instinctive shaping of phrases by a great conductor. For the rest of this lecture, let's continue on with the first 11 bars of the D section, cutting it exactly in half. I'll cover the massive repeated chords, soaring melodies, and rock bottom bass octaves in the next lecture. But for now, let's study the build up to the ultimate peak of excitement, just like the second part of any dramatic trilogy. 
What distinguishes this first part from the rest of section D is the continued use of those broken octaves that started in section C, except that we see an expansion of their role from a simple pulse in the left hand to a cascade flowing across five octaves of range. So that immediately brings up the question of how to connect these octaves for the listener, to make them feel an uninterrupted flow of motion from top to bottom in each bar. But that's only the beginning. There's the added concern of whether these low F-sharp octaves on the fourth beat of each of the first eight bars should be orchestrated as a separate element, or as anticipatory notes for the broken octaves in the rest of the bars. If that weren't fun enough, there's also the issue of the right hand dropping the cascading F-sharps down an octave in bars 40 to 41, to better contrast with the middle voice thirds, and also to more smoothly connect with the position of the left hand. So the orchestrator has to decide whether to disregard this convenient repositioning and leave those F-sharps up in the stratosphere like all the other bars, or to make their lower placement a feature that makes sense within the context of the passage, emotionally and coloristically. And if we choose to do that, then will these octaves speak out clearly or get swallowed into the thickening texture of the octave melody and middle voice thirds? Then moving on to the next four bars, we see the lowest staff taking over the broken octaves and keeping them in the bass register for all the tricky trading off of hands that Barvinsky indicates. We're injecting even more energy here in anticipation of the coming climactic passage. So the treatment of these octaves needs to have more momentum and distinct thrust than how they were orchestrated in section C. Then there's that issue of the leap up to the D octave in the right hand in the middle of bar 45. Is that a melody note or part of the accompaniment? Or both? Meanwhile, the thematic content is essentially restated again with all the issues we ran into before as orchestrators. How to keep the texture fresh and not just repeat everything we did before how to use the colors of the orchestra to progress the emotional journey of each succeeding phrase, how to anticipate and build toward any upcoming change in the intensity of the music. But we have the added problem now of leaving room in the sound picture for those cascading octaves, whether in contrast or compatibility. Then we have to set up the next page's fortissimo with those more focused, aggressive chords in the last four bars. How do we make that all feel inevitable, sweeping up the listener to a fever pitch? And how does the orchestration of these last four bars evolve from the previous bars and lead to the second half of this section? Think about all these issues as we let Violina Petrochenko explain it all to us in pianistic terms. Her playing was my guide in determining the proportions of different functions and the coloration of my textures. So let's bring back the orchestra now. You'll notice that I left out the reference piano staves on this page, and that relates to the much smaller staff size throughout because of how many active players are involved in this passage. If I had to leave the piano staves in, then things would really look tiny. This way I can display the staves at 5.5 millimeter size and bring in the guide staves when necessary. All the same, you can see that the addition of more instruments is a gradual process here not really getting thickly textured until about the seventh bar after rehearsal D. So let's analyze this page as two separate subsections, the first seven bars and then the last four. We started looking at this section in the piano score with a focus on the cascading octaves. So let's do the same for my orchestration. I wanted to progress the texture from gleaming to glistening. In other words, not just a reflecting ray of light, but a fluttering radiance. So observe my choices here for the beginning of the cascade. Both violin groups doubling that line on the first bar of D, an octave above where it's scored in piano, dropping down to the same pitch on the next bar, and then alternating back and forth over the next two bars. Notice that the firsts use a standard bowed approach, while the seconds double the same pitches playing tremolo. 
For a more radiant tone, I've also added alternating piccolo and flute doubling the violins. If the conductor limits the crescendo hairpins in the strings to just a little flaring of strength, there's no reason why the flute family can't contribute to the timbre in their lowest octaves. The violas play the same line an octave lower, helping to hand off the upper part of the cascading line to the cellos at a closer proximity. Those cellos then pick up the octaves and continue the line down to the bottom F sharps, with some thickening by A2 bassoons and punctuation by soft timpani strokes. I also treat those beginning low F sharp octaves in each bar as anticipatory, looking forward to the joining of the bass register instruments to the cascade, rather than separated. So I punctuate them with all the aforementioned instruments, plus a touch of double bass at the bottom. I avoid bringing in the contrabassoon here, because I want the overall texture to remain lighter than light. But how do I get the line to glisten? Part of that concern I've already addressed with the tremolo second violins. But that's only the start. I double the violins and violas note for note in the harp, with a touch of glockenspiel on the top line. That's the gleam. Now for the glistening. Alternating trills and first flute with clarinet and piccolo on the same note an octave lower. I intentionally want that folk flute sound of the lower octave of the piccolo to combine with the clarinet's lower clarino timbre. The clarinet can easily outplay the piccolo here, but once again, I'm relying on the conductor to make sure the players balance out the difference in strength. Just as I am with these trills in the next two bars with alto flute, English horn, and first violins, though I'll admit that expecting a reasonable balance on the second combined trill may be less realistic, as the orchestra starts to surge. These two bars are probably the most problematic so far, dropping down yet another octave against the thematic content in the brass. So I've changed the quality of the timbre and attack here. It's actually first clarinet that gets the entire first part of the cascade, flowing down into its Chalamot register with some violin arco doubling, leaving off, of course, before that lowest sounding F sharp out of range for violins. To further help bring out that line against the brass, I changed the second violins and violas to pizzicato. Now there's a real point of connection to the pizzicato basses and the pinging timpani, on top of the continuing bassoons and cellos. I finish off the second half of each bar with tremolo second violins, adding a flurrying thickening to the trills in the first violins and the winds I just mentioned. Going forward from there, I make an executive decision to reinterpret the cascading octaves, reversing them back upwards in a big push into the next phrase. Notice that I bring back all the previous participants, shifting around some of their roles to maximize impact. The tremolos are now in violas, doubling normally bowed second violins this time. The violas sit on that comfortable F-sharp 5, instead of leaping up another octave alongside the trilling second violins. The clarinets double both the seconds and violas, filling in the missing low F-sharp 3 that the seconds can't reach, and then adding an extra kicking leap during the trill and tremolo. Meanwhile, an octave higher, the first violins track all from above, ending in a sky-high F-sharp 6. Doubling the violins, I've added first flute and piccolo. At the end of the bar, the flute repeats the same three notes, thickening up the clarinet, while the piccolo really goes for it way up there, with some assistance from the glockenspiel. Finally, the harp glissando does the trick of clumping everything together up there in the listener's perception, and directing their attention to the new upper placement of the thematic content in the next phrase. Grounding everything from below at the end are some thumping accents on bassoons, cellos, and timpani, with arco fortissimo basses dipping down the octave. That's a lot to take in all at once, so let's restore your view to the first full page of score, and have a listen to those first seven bars along to the mock-up. Though it'll be tempting to let the warm melody in the brass steal the show, try to ignore that, and instead focus on my orchestration of those cascading lines that we just studied so thoroughly. We'll get back to the brass in a minute, I promise. <laughs> And 
now for the brass. And they're nothing too complex, simply a transcription of the central staves of the piano score at first, with the first trumpet and first trombone covering the octave melody, and the low horns and second trombone sharing the thirds below. Notice that I'm doubling second and fourth horns on the lower pitches of the thirds, while the second trombone covers the upper pitches. My intention is to achieve a very mellow, integrated sound here, with the rounder overtones of the horns tempering the more direct, heavy brass above. The result should be a thematic statement that sings out warmly from the middle, without shouting down the subtle scoring of the cascading octaves around it. From there, I allow the brass to gradually increase their potency with the addition of more voices, not just a dynamic push. At the end of the fifth bar of Rehearsal D, I introduce first and third horns doubling the middle voice an octave higher, sitting right between the first trumpet and first trombone. Then as the dynamics really push forwards, I combine all the horns doubling that central harmonic position for strength, sitting on the major third of the F-sharp seventh chord in the next bar, while the heavy brass cover the root and fifth, with the bass trombone on that inverted seventh of E below, and of course tuba rooting the bottom F-sharp. And that takes us right into the next phrase. Notice the balance here. From the overall piano dynamic of the beginning of the page, I've increased the dynamic to forte in the brass, just as in the piano score, while keeping the winds and brass one notch warmer from the fifth bar, pushing them all the way up to fortissimo by the eighth bar. As we'll see in the third lecture, I'll be maintaining these proportions, even as things get way bigger in the next half of section D. But let's stay focused on this tutti for now, analyzing its elements from top to bottom. Compared to the piano score, I've elevated that right-hand chordal melody a full octave higher in the violins, across divisi firsts and seconds. That screaming chorale up there is doubled note for note by piccolo, first flute, and clarinets, a very trebly, cutting sound at fortissimo. Octave tremolo violas do double duty of both stabilizing the harmony above and adding a lot of tension and excitement, especially doubled by trills in first oboe and English horn. An octave below, as originally scored by Barvinsky, the brass replicates this same harmonized melody, with some adjustments. Probably the strongest voice in this entire four-bar phrase will be the E-flat trumpet, ringing out clearly from inside the tumult, playing an octave lower than the piccolo and upper divisi first violins. The doubling from second clarinet will only make its timbre sound more penetrating and incisive. I'm adding the E-flat not just for its ease of range, but also for its more commanding quality of tone in that register. An octave below, first trumpet and first horn lend some support, with even a third octave below that from the second horn in the first two bars of this tutti phrase. The rest of the brass fill in those notes as scored in those middle piano staves, I felt that they worked pretty well as they were, without the need for too much adjustment. Distributing the horns over the same pitches as the heavy brass kept the tone to more of an earthy glow rather than a raspy bellow, allowing the E-flat trumpet a more individual tone above all the brass. That just leaves those leaping octaves below, and now I do want them to grind a bit. So it's finally time to bring in the contrabassoon, doubling most of the bass part, which combines in an overlapping relationship with cellos doubled by bass clarinet and A2 bassoons. The lower heavy brass simulate the effect of the sustain pedal in underpinning the bottom notes, as well as joining in for emphasis on some notes at the end of the ninth and 10th bars after rehearsal D. I also keep the timpani's roll curtailed to just some emphatic strokes here and there, saving up the thundering for the next passage. Just one big crash on cymbal is quite enough to energize the entire phrase, maintaining a focus on the burgeoning emotion of the melodic arc, and not the fireworks just yet. Let's have one more listen to all of that now, focusing on the warm, subtle brass at the beginning of the page this time, and how it leaves room for the soft cascading lines to flow around it with clarity, and then how it all starts to push more urgently from warm to hot, and even a bit scorching in the upper winds, upper strings, and E-flat trumpet. You may have noticed that I discard Barvinsky's original marking of Poco Allargando at the end of bar 45. 
That would be the second to last bar on this screen. And increase the tempo going into that second phrase, then increase it again going into the next page. A conductor might want to start Poco a Poco a Celerando from the fifth bar after D, and just keep it gradually increasing the speed all the way to the end of the page. That might actually sound more natural. But either way works in my view, and also takes its cue from the very natural increase of excitement you hear in the piano version. That's also a great way to introduce the E-flat trumpet, as opposed to keeping things the same tempo all the way through. See what you think. But before we run the mock-up again, I would just like to express my thanks to viewers and subscribers here on YouTube, to all my supporters on Patreon, and especially everyone who sent some direct support to Ukrainian musicians in need via the Lisa Batyashvili Foundation Special Relief Fund. If you want to make a donation, there's a link in the info below. It would be a great way of honoring the legacy of this year's composer, Vasil Barvinsky. And even just a few dollars would make a real difference to our fellow orchestral composers and musicians who are really struggling right now. If you can't, then I totally understand, but if you can, it would be awesome. Here's another run of that audio mock-up to this section of my score, and I'll see you in the next video.